Our scripture reading this morning comes to us from the third chapter of the Gospel according to John. A certain Pharisee named Nicodemus, a member of the Sanhedrin, came to Jesus by night. Rabbi, he said, we know you are a teacher come from God for no one can perform the signs and wonders you do unless by the power of God. Jesus gave Nicodemus this answer. The truth of the matter is, no one can be born from above. The truth of the matter is, unless one is born from above, one cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said, how can an adult be born a second time? I can't go back into my mother's womb to be born again. Jesus replied, the truth of the matter is, no one can enter God's kingdom without being born of water and the spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh. What is born of spirit is spirit. So don't be surprised when I tell you that you must be born from above. The wind blows where it will. You hear the sound it makes. But you don't know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born from the Spirit. Ancient words from our tradition for our present day understanding. Like some of you, <clears throat> I've been accosted by cedar trees, so I've got a, if anybody needs me to share it, I can you know, pass the little drink around. <clears throat> but I, I had um, a, a few coughs in the first service, so I'm going to try to spare you that if, if possible. Well, this is a, <coughs> forget it, <coughs> forget it, um, so much for that resolution. Um, but this series is going to be a, a two-month series, and it's something I've really tried to think about because I know how hard this time is politically for people who care. If money's all you care about, you're doing just fine politically. Uh, if America's the only country you care about, you know, congratulations, you're just, you're doing fine. But the rest of us are hurting, both in this nation and around the world. And so I want to do a series on finding hope uh, in times like this, realistic hope, not hope that's based on you believing some Presbyterian minister, but in an invitation to go deeper in your own experience and discover certain dynamics that are there. And I think that's what scripture is intended to do, not to tell you to believe something that you can't test, but to go more profoundly, more deeply into who you are and see if they're not these dynamics that would give you peace and joy in this challenging time. The picture that's kind of burned in my head this week, every day there's something, um, every hour there's something, uh, pretty much. But the picture of the president's son with one of these weapons that's been used in the mass murders, him lifting it up proudly, with the picture of Hillary Clinton on the bullet clip. And the mask of the Crusades with the, the Jerusalem cross that was used in the slaughter of Muslims uh, in the past and to hold that up three days after the bombing and the assassination of the um, Iranian general. If we're going to get in touch with peace, we're going to have to go really deep, right? That kind of brutality. Now, I would not be worthy to speak to you today if I did not say that is fascism. Right? If I did not say that is terrorism. To do with the veiled threat, if you can call that even veiled. 
you lift up a, a weapon of mass murder with a political opponent's picture on it, and more importantly, send that message out to the Middle East. I think that's probably who the target may have been. Because one of the things colonizers do is agitate and push on the people of resistance so that they get afraid and act up. And then that becomes the proof, the evidence, that America needs to be even more vicious. If you are a person of faith, if you are here as a Christian today, that should be very personal to you because they used Jesus on a, a rifle to inflict fear on your brothers and sisters in the Middle East who are Muslim. So we're going to look at a story today and to understand the meaning of this story, you may have to get past the Christianity that you were taught that produces that kind of shallow hate. Because that's not where the answer lies. Christianity is a fusion of Judaism and paganism. Things like baptism and communion, you can't find those in the Jewish roots. Those are pagan roots. And so when we want to unpack and understand the message that a story like this is, is telling us, we have to understand this is for everybody. This is not just for Christians. If salvation was only for Christians, who would want to go to that heaven? <laughs> if heaven looks like the 700 Club or the PTL Club, <laughs> my God, that would be hell. You know, people with big puffy hair and... So that's why if, if I get at the pearly gates, I'm going to say, okay, we're the fundamentalists right, I'm going the other direction. <laughs> but because of the anti-Semitic history of our faith, we have to point out that this story is not criticizing Judaism at all. Nicodemus has its parallel in every religion in the world. It's fundamentalism. The word Nicodemus means conqueror of the people. This is the kind of religious person that sat at the president's table. They didn't have presidents, but Herod, chief priests, and all this kind of thing. We get the word Nike from the first part of his name. Nike, conqueror. And the demos is the, the second part which we get democracy from, which used to be a system of government um, in the nation, but I won't. <laughs> so Nicodemus, this story is written you know, generations after Jesus is dead. So there's no way John can get back to the original story. It's a spiritual parable. It's about awakening, it's about enlightenment. It's not to be understood at the surface level, and I'll show you that the story directly says that as we get there. But Nicodemus represents typical preacher type who hears Jesus doing things and it doesn't fit in with his idea of what religion should be. It's not nationalistic. It's not hate-driven and fear-driven. So he goes to him, but he goes at night. That's an interesting detail that's stuck in there. So he wants to learn, but he doesn't want to be any, anybody see him doing this. So he goes at night and says, you must be doing something right um, <clears throat> to have the power that you do. And then Jesus says <coughs> a kind of a parable thing. Get a discount on the tickets <laughs> for the water break. But he says a certain word. He says, you have to be born again. Now, you've probably heard that phrase before. But the word is ambiguous. It can mean be born again. It can mean be born 
from above. Most importantly, I think, it means to get back to the fundamental principle of things. The word to be born there is the word we get Genesis from. Getting back to your roots. So it feels like new birth, but it's, it's because you're sloughing off all the habits, all of the things that get in the way of life, of deep life. So John has poor Nicodemus who's being used as a comedic foil in this story. Who knows what the real um, person was like. But he takes that teaching literally and he says, how can you go back into the mother's womb? That's telling you don't take scripture literally, right? This is the wrong way to do it. He's misunderstanding the text when he takes it literally. The word spirit is very different in the Jewish tradition than it is in the Greek tradition. Jesus was a Jewish person his whole life, right? Now, the story's being put together by pagans, a mixture of pagans and Jewish people, but Jesus was Jewish from start to finish, so what he's talking about is a prophetic understanding of Judaism, not a dismissal of Judaism. And what he's saying is, the word for spirit in Greek is like for ghost. It's a disembodied spirit. That's not what Jesus would have meant. The word spirit in Hebrew means breath. It means wind. It implies the circulation and interconnectivity of things. Imagine if instead of trying to believe that God is this invisible kind of Casper with a lot of power, it started with your personal breath and led you out to the breath that you share with the other people in this room, with the animals on earth, with the plants. The word also means the wind, so it's, it's cosmic. It's understanding the connection between who you are most personally and your cosmic life, the life you share with every other being. I think this is critically important, and I think it's been critically lost in the, in the Christian tradition, that the body of Christ does not mean Jesus' corpse. It never meant that. Easter is not the story of corpses getting up. That may be really inspiring for some. For me, it gives me the heebie-jeebies. Bodies stay dead. But it's using symbolism and poetry to say you are a part of something larger than yourself. And you don't have to take a Presbyterian's word for it. It's that feeling you have in the woods where there's an inter interwovenness between you and the animals and the trees. You just, it's not, you're not grasping an idea of unity. You're dissolving back into a kind of kindred spirit. I want to suggest that our ideas of unity are the most divisive things in the world. Right? As soon as we're talking about unity, we copyright it in our head and then fight over whose idea of unity is the best. What if we all instead just dissolve back into what we have in common? We might discover that's also what we most personally are. That's the kind of parable that leads you to an experience of interconnectedness that I think Jesus is trying to give you. If you go to a tree in the forest and you really look at that tree, it's not just one thing. There's minerals and water coming up through its roots. There's animals and critters coming up through its roots. Its branches reach out to the sun. There's water coming in from the rain. If you really look at nature, it, there's never just one thing. Everything is interconnected. Inner breathing, inner living. That's the spirit that's being talked about. In Buddhism, it's called Buddha mind. Right? The equivalent, I think, to the body of Christ is Buddha mind, which is you recognize there's something sacred in every being that you meet. That the personalities matter, but we're all expressions of something more basic and deeper than that. And somehow, in times like this, when there's no visible hope, 
privately to find the interconnectedness that opens up all kinds of new possibilities. Because if things are interconnected, if the system is open, then it's never hopeless. Never hopeless. Every little thing you do affects everything else. You have to feel that. It's not a matter of agreeing with an old guy in the front of the room. It's going into your own heart and feeling, yes, that's true. That is my experience. That when I remember I'm interconnected with things, I lose that despair and realize everything I do matters. Robert Kennedy went on a trip. I think he went to South Africa. He was going to talk about apartheid with people from South Africa. <clears throat> Can you imagine, this was like 66 or something, how hopeless those people felt? They were already where we're going. Right, they already had the beloved leaders who overrode any kind of separation of powers. Here's what Robert Kennedy said to them. <clears throat> he said, it's from the numberless, diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time we stand for an ideal or act to improve the lot of others or strike out against injustice, we send forth tiny ripples of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Amazing. The body of Christ, the Buddha mind, the interconnectedness of things, the tree of life in the Jewish tradition. Every mystic says the same things, but they say it in different ways. If you ever go on Google, you'll find without much searching that there are those who disagree with my theory of the resurrection. Christianity Today. Um, I do not believe that the resurrection is physical bodies getting up. I think it's talking about the life process itself. I believe that the resurrection for the disciples took place when they recognized Christ in each other and then in strangers and then in friends and then in enemies and it was everywhere. Every face was the expression of this mystical experience they had had with their beloved teacher. Which means the resurrection hasn't happened for you if you can't see it in the transgender youth. It means the resurrection hasn't happened for you if you don't recognize it in the undocumented immigrant. It means the resurrection hasn't happened for you if you can't see it in the lowliest person, the most miserable person, the most imprisoned person. One of my favorite characters is Eugene V. Debs, um, who was a godless communist, or socialist anyway. Um, and, you know, it's just kind of hard to read the New Testament and not wind up realizing. I don't think Jesus would be in favor of forcing socialism through state control. But I sure as hell know he wouldn't be in favor of a capitalist system that makes the beloved community impossible. I don't understand Christians who talk about loving the poor, freeing the enslaved, building a new world, and then vote for people that make that impossible. Right? We can disagree about politics, but if you don't want the world Jesus was describing, then please find a new religion. Right? Stop talking in his name if you don't want the kind of world he talked about in the Sermon on the Mount. There are lots of great religions, but Donald Trump isn't one of them. 
It's not okay to hate Muslims. It's not okay to crush the hopes of immigrant people, of refugees. It's not okay to say your nation first. That's not what a Christian does. And I would not be worthy to come before you if I did not say that as clearly as I can. Eugene V. Debs, did I read this quote? I went off on a spasm, sorry about that. <laughs> Eugene V. Debs, socialist, uh, ran for president five times, I think. One time he ran from prison and got a million votes. <laughs> because they got him for insurrection, you know, criticizing war, criticizing the leadership was all it took. To me, the difference between capitalism and socialism, I think that every system is going to be a mixture of things, but do you put people first or do you put making money first? Could, could we get that clear? Is property or nature more important to you? Call it what you want. But anyway, I'm sorry, I'm still. <sighs> I'll take my medicine after that. <clears throat> so he's before the judge. He's being threatened with going to prison, but he's not very tactful here. He goes, Your Honor, years ago, I recognized my kinship with all living beings, and I made up my mind that I was not one bit better than the meanest on earth. I said then, and I say now, that while there is a lower class, I am in it. And while there is a criminal element, I am of it. And while there is a soul in prison, I am not free. Inner being, interconnectedness, the common body of humankind. T. Dot Han is Buddhist, but he says this stuff almost exactly the same, if not better, in some ways. But he talks about that intimate feeling of realizing everything you do makes a difference in the world. Everything you do. He said, when I wash my teapot, to me, it's like I'm giving a bath to the baby Buddha or the baby Jesus. Because it goes out in ways that you can't measure. You don't know. If you went to my Facebook page this, this week, I had a picture of Frank and Joyce Sloan. 70th birthday, they're mentioning that. He's 95, she's 89. They were going to go to the protest against the Iraq war at the Capitol, but he's just getting over pneumonia. So they couldn't do that. So they made up some signs, they got their walkers, and on a windy day went out and stood in front of their retirement center. If you want to see a kick butt activist, go on my Facebook page. Pardon my French. We could always do something. They said they weren't sure it made any difference, but they felt better when they did it. See, those are my heroes and sheroes. In this world, somebody who does the little thing with a really bad hand, without much control over the world, they still sing the new song of the new humanity. And they, do it, they don't do it because they hate what's on the other side. They do it because they love humankind and people and life and nature. What our story didn't tell you today that you may need to know before you leave is that Nicodemus changes. In the story, later, Jesus is on trial, and it's Nicodemus from the Sanhedrin that says, we need to listen to this guy and not jump to conclusions. He changed, changed. And then finally, when Jesus was executed, he's the one who steps forward and helps make the funeral meaningful. I will never forget when we were working on the hate crimes bill. We were losing it, time was running out, it was almost midnight. And the most Bible-thumping, gay-bashing Republican uh, lawmaker crossed the aisle. He crossed the aisle because 
a lesbian advocate had touched his heart. And he realized he didn't want to be hateful. He didn't want to be petty. He, did, he didn't want to be that anymore. Can you imagine if we were ambassadors? Not against Trump, but in favor of kindness and sanity and rationality. Just humanity. In a moment, we're going to take communion. This does not belong to Christianity. This is a celebration of the interconnectedness of things. Of the fact that when Jesus is dying, he wants his disciples to know they haven't lost that. They will lose him, but he will now live on through them. It's a very touching, artful moment if you don't turn it into magic. The bread is not going to turn into the body of Jesus. The blood is going to be, oh, it's, the grape juice is going to be grape juice. But it's a celebration of a hope that is not on the line in our current place and time or any current place and time. It's a reminder that every word you say this week, every deed you do, every thought you do, changes the world. Robert Kennedy said again, I think as well as it could be said, he said, it is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time we stand up for an ideal or act to improve the lots of others or strike out against injustice, we send forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. In other words, precisely because everything is interconnected, we are never without hope. I leave you to your own reflection on these words. <laughs>